you really have to give the Paper Mario series credit for one thing. It's never been afraid to try something new, even if that new thing isn't exactly what anyone wanted. And Paper Mario The Origami King continues the tradition, this time by mixing classic elements of the series' past with others that are entirely new, resulting in something that feels both familiar and fresh. So was it able to surprise and delight me as with Color Splash, or is it another Sticker Star Caliber disappointment? Oh god, get it away! Get it away! Well, the answer is surprisingly complicated, as my adventure has been an absolute roller coaster of highs, lows, and everything in between. The story begins with the Origami King himself, who just wants to fold up everyone and everything in his own image of Origami. And after doing just that to Peach and much of Bowser's army, he ensnares Peach's castle and streamers and relocates the entire thing to a distant mountain. And thus begins Mario's quest to explore the world and destroy each of the five streamers at their source to free the castle and save the princess, along with the rest of the world, from a permanent origami fate. And that's pretty much a whole story outside of a few key developments. So yeah, a story-heavy game this is not, instead focusing on smaller set pieces to maintain interest in a surprisingly lengthy adventure. Moments like exploring a forest as the trees whisper around you, or helping a cult of Koopa Troopas find salvation. yeah you heard me, or solving the mystery of a seemingly abandoned cruise ship. These set pieces, among others, are a pure delight, and even though most of the characters you'll encounter are the generic variety, it is fun to interact with and talk to Bowser's papery minions, who have formed a temporary truce with Mario on account of the fact that they now have a common enemy in the form of the Origami King. And it's that common enemy that even sees the King's sister, Olivia, tagging along with Mario for the entire journey, offering up advice when needed in order to bring her cruel brother's terrifying reign to an end. I really liked Olivia! She's kind-hearted and super sweet, and so when the game explores some surprisingly darker moments, I found myself emotionally invested in the outcome. The overall presentation is stellar across the board, with some truly lovely visuals that bring the worlds to life in a way rarely seen before, in that it's shockingly effective despite the fact everything is made of paper, and the game makes no bones about reminding you of that fact constantly. And just get a glimpse of this intentionally realistic water. It looks so good! In addition, the soundtrack at its best is among the best in the series. From even just the moment that I started up the game and heard the catchy tune in the title screen, I knew that my ears would be in for a treat. And then, of course, there's a dialogue too, which is well written throughout the game, dense with charm and wit. But for as funny as it can be, it never quite approaches the level of the consistently hilarious dialogue found in Color Splash, though there are still a few laugh out loud moments to be found here. Olivia, in particular, is constantly offering up her own unique sense of humor, and I love it. Now, besides Olivia, you'll also be joined by a variety of partner characters throughout the game, too, though very much on a temporary basis. These include characters like Bobby of the Bomb with Amnesia, or a Toad Professor who specializes in archaeological finds, and even Bowser Jr.? These guys are all fun in their own right, and I rather enjoyed what they added to the story, even if that's just about the only element they add, too because the partners exist almost entirely for narrative-based reasons. Sure, they might occasionally help out during battle, but you have no control over them and they can't even take damage themselves, so it really doesn't make that much of an impact. And outside of that, they mostly serve no other gameplay purpose, with the sole exception of the Toad Professor, who actually does have a couple of uses out in the world, like being able to dig up treasure. And I feel like this is a bit of a missed opportunity when the other partner characters could have surely offered something of their own too. It's surprising to see a Paper Mario get so close to a beloved element of the original games without quite getting all the way there. Now the bulk of your time will be spent exploring the surprisingly large world, in regions that dwarf the size of those in previous games of the series. Seriously, some of these areas are huge, to the extent that a couple even require vehicles to traverse, like a boat or even a dune buggy that's oddly shaped like a boot. What's that, a boot? But hey, it is measured in Yoshi power, and that definitely got a smirk from me. So at times, I really enjoyed the expanded scope. Zipping across the desert was pretty fun, especially when you're running over enemies. And sailing the high seas definitely evoked memories of Wind Waker, especially since it's paired with an amazing track. God, it's so good! But at other times, the size of everything can feel a little immense particularly given Mario's obnoxiously slow walking speed, which is something the developer seemingly realized given the fact that Toad Town even has warp points just to take you from one side to the other. 
but perhaps my biggest issue with the game overall is a slower pace. Especially when compared to Color Splash, which threw new settings and ideas at you constantly. Whereas in this game, the more interesting set pieces are set pretty far apart, which subjects you to the more meandering nature that exploring the world for some pretty lengthy periods of time. During which, you'll complete activities like filling in the not so bombless holes by tossing confetti at them, or looking for additional secrets in order to 100% each region, which includes finding treasures and tracking down hundreds of origami toads. Yeah, they're cute and can be funny, but by the 30th time, it starts to get a little... told. See what I did there? You'll also occasionally have to make use of a technique called the Thousand Fold Arms, in which you'll use the motion controls to awkwardly tear away parts of the environment. It's fine, I guess, but it's so brain-dead simple that I almost forgot to include it in my review. The points at which you have to use it are made incredibly obvious, outside of the few times I accidentally spawned one to doing some other seemingly unrelated task. Now, there are pockets within each region that are thoroughly entertaining, such as exploring a ninja training facility. Heck yes! But the build-up to it, in which I had to explore a near dozen mostly empty buildings, was far less exciting. And that's too often the case for much of the game. You'll encounter cool moments surrounded by a sea of mediocrity. The highlights, fun as they may be, are just spread far enough apart that getting to them was sometimes a chore. The desert, for example, sends you on a quest involving four towers. That, while not necessarily taking a ton of time, does start to feel unnecessarily repetitive. But I really did like the Vegas town you encounter as part of that journey. You'll also explore a few temples too, which as you might expect, put an emphasis on puzzle solving. Some of which are pretty clever. One of them even managed to put a fun twist on the typically rote sliding block puzzles. So yeah, I mostly enjoyed these areas and found them to be a nice break from the overall world exploration. Of course, there is one other major element that you'll encounter when exploring. Enemies! And they actually come in two different forms. The origami forms, which you'll face off in a turn-based battle with, which we'll have much more on in a second, as well as paper mache baddies. And these guys are actually pretty cool, because you actually fight them out in the world in real time. A little bit like in Super Paper Mario. And I really did enjoy these moments. Yeah, they're not especially complex, but they were a nice break from the more methodical nature of the origami battles. And it's those origami battles that will mark the game's most unique and likely divisive feature, which takes the idea of a turn-based battle to an entirely new level. So every one of these battles is split into two phases, the puzzle portion and the action portion. But it's the former where you'll be spending most of your time. In the puzzle portion, you have a limited amount of moves, up to three, in which to spin or slide ring panels in an attempt to consolidate the enemies either into lines or groups of four. If you pull it off, not only will all the enemies be neatly organized, allowing you to damage more of them at once, but you'll even get a power boost too, inflicting 50% more damage during the action phase. After which, the remaining enemies are set to random spots on the grid, and the entire process starts anew. It's actually a pretty neat idea, though there's a definite learning curve to it, as at times it can feel far too easy to find yourself completely lost, given the sheer amount of movement options you have at any given time, and the fact that trying to move one enemy can screw up something else elsewhere on the board. Should you spin the ring clockwise or counterclockwise, or maybe slide that panel forward or back? There's a lot to keep track of. It can get pretty complex, and the fact that there's an ever-ticking timer only adds more pressure although you can quite literally buy yourself more time by cashing in some coins at any point. Now, if you can't quite get a handle on it at any given battle, you can ultimately just power your way through these things too, but it might take considerably longer and leave you open to more frequent attacks. And then, of course, you can always try running away too, but it only works half the time at best. At any rate, once you better start to understand the mechanics, as well as the fact that every battle has at least one pre-planned solution, it starts to make a bit more sense. And it's in that moment of clarity when the satisfaction of locking everything perfectly into place pays off. Especially in the instances where it lets you clear out the entire field at once. It's like scoring a Tetris. Now, if you just can't quite wrap your mind around the mechanics, there are still a few other resources available. For one, you can bribe the audience for help, though the results can vary, with them potentially rearranging parts on the battle grid for you, or they may refill your health instead. It's an option I definitely took advantage of more than just a handful of times. There's also an accessibility feature where the game will automatically reveal one possible final solution to the puzzle. But perplexingly, this option, along with a couple of others, have to be unlocked, despite being found on the option screen. And though unlocking them is pretty simple, I still went most of the game without even knowing they existed. So yeah, make sure to stop by the battle lab again at some point because it's quite a useful feature, especially since it doesn't really compromise the core puzzle solving challenge. Comparatively, the action portion of each battle is much more straightforward, possibly to a disappointing extent. Because once you have the enemy sorted, you really only have two attack options. Jump or hammer. 
And I use the word options loosely, as the one you choose is almost entirely dictated by how the enemies are arranged in the puzzle phase, with jumps being used to clear out enemy lines, whereas hammer attacks are for the groups. Now sure, there are stronger variants of both attacks available in the form of breakable moves that you can equip, but there is still the same basic idea, just more powerful. Oh, and you can use items too, but by and large, there is almost zero strategy to these fights. It doesn't really matter which individual enemies you attack first, it's more about how many you can hit at once. As a result, there's no real tension or frantic decision making, as your actions are essentially predetermined by how the enemies are arranged. The only real skill in this portion comes in the way of properly timing the action commands to strengthen your attacks or your defense. Although speaking of defense, one thing I do like is how the enemies would generally work together and attack in a group formation, which not only saves time, but is pretty fun to watch too. And it also helps keep you on your toes. In effect, the action portions serve as more of a break between puzzles than anything else, which is probably why they don't have a time limit. So it's probably best to view the battles as more puzzling obstacles, especially since, like Sticker Star, experience points are nowhere to be found, which is an odd step back from Color Splash which partially addressed this issue. Now I want to be clear, I actually mostly didn't mind this aspect of the game. I don't think experience points are necessarily critical to the Paper Mario experience, even if I would prefer having them. The main issue is that, while I did enjoy puzzle solving, there are times where it starts to feel a little repetitive, and I just want to get on with my journey. So without experience points acting as a carrot to pull me through, the back-to-back -back battles did start to feel tiresome at points, and I even found myself trying to avoid them entirely when possible, which is surprisingly difficult to do for a lot of them. Okay, so that covers the enemy battles, but the boss encounters are something else entirely, almost acting as more of a board game, except one in which Mario's the only real player, as he now finds himself on the outside of the ring, having to rearrange pieces on the board to create a path of arrows in order to reach a boss in the middle, all the while triggering very specific events along the way. And that's how every single turn plays out, as the boss's attacks will always knock Mario back to the start. So, I have a love-hate relationship with these things. In a general sense, they are overwhelmingly complicated, consisting of a mess of icons to keep track of as you're sorting the playing field, which includes movement arrows, attack spots, envelopes with critical information, treasure chests that contain essential items, damage multipliers, turn multipliers, as well as on buttons that activate separate magic circles for various special attacks. Woo! It's a ridiculous amount to take in, and you have to somehow chart a path through it all often in a very specific sequence, all the while racing a dwindling clock and defending against the boss's powerful attacks. It can be ridiculous. Which is to say, it's also pretty rewarding once you finally get a grasp on the situation. I want to call out the battles against the various art and office supplies in particular, as it's genuinely clever in how they attack, manipulate the board, as well as the manner in which you have to attack them yourselves, sometimes requiring you to come at them from very specific angles, which takes full advantage of the 360 degree arena. And I also love how these guys are characterized and brought to light through their animation. Who knew office supplies could have a personality? Now on the other side of the coin, we have the Velemental bosses. And I hate them. I hate these guys so much. These boorish fiends generally consist of multiple interconnected phases, where it's not at all clear what exactly you have to do. And that's even taking into account the envelope tips, as well as being able to ask Olivia for help. She was often of no help to me here. The extremely specific steps that it takes to fell these creatures are frustratingly opaque, and the actual process for beating them is tedious beyond belief, especially with how a single misstep can revert the process to a prior form, essentially making you restart from scratch. I found myself spending well over an hour on a couple of them, which made me want to throw my Switch out the window. Now, even though there's only a handful of these battles, they nearly sank the entire experience for me. So I was quite relieved to find that the bosses that come after the final Velemental one are among the best in the game. In fact, the Origami King's final stretch is among my favorites in the entire series. I can't show you much of it for spoiler based reasons, but know this. The final area definitely lives up to the origami world that the king envisions, including a final encounter that I had an absolute blast with. And that's just made this review so darn difficult. The Origami King is an incredibly uneven experience, filled with some brilliant highs as well as some very disappointing lows. It's a jack of all trades, but a master of few. It remixes classic elements of the past, but generally in ways that fall short of the benchmark. The world here, for as great as it looks, isn't as rich as the one in the Thousand Year Door, whereas the overall pace and humor fall short of color splash. And don't even get me started on those Velementals again, which are really more like Hellementals. And yet, despite this, it gets just enough right to warrant sticking through the entire game. Whether it's the amazing visuals, cute dialogue, 
fun set pieces, surprisingly touching moments, weird scenarios, or the brilliant music, there's a lot of good stuff happening here. Even the battle system has its merits, as long as you can embrace the puzzle solving and lack of experience points. And on top of it all, Olivia might be one of Nintendo's best partner characters yet, offering a genuine warmth wrapped up within an innocent presence. For as uneven as Paper Mario the Origami King can be, it was the fantastic final few hours that solidified my otherwise mixed impression. I liked it! Yes, it has its issues, but the highs are worth sticking through the lows. There's just something about the comical weirdness of Paper Mario that no other game series can quite capture, and you might be remiss in missing out on it. And with that, thank you so much for watching, and make sure to click that subscribe button and ring that bell for more on Paper Mario the Origami King and everything else Nintendo Switch.